Hi, everyone, and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn from the Nightlife Programming Team. I'm Christina, the event producer. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you're all taking good care of yourselves, physically, mentally, and emotionally. As always, we're so thrilled to have you spend your Thursday night with us. For, nine, for tonight's Night School, we're heading off to Chile. And the reason we're doing that is because the Morrison Planetarium just premiered its newest show called Big Astronomy, which is all about the big observatories and other big astronomy work that's being done there uh, in Chile and also why it's happening there. And so we asked Ryan Wyatt, who's the director of the Morrison Planetarium, to introduce tonight's guest, who he actually introduced us to. So here's Ryan. Well, good evening. Hi. Well, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be talking about astronomy in Chile. Uh, the show is called Big Astronomy, and the subtitle is People, Places, Discoveries, and you'll be hearing about all three of those factors uh, tonight because what's amazing about Chile is the location, a, a, a beautiful spot on Earth that happens to be fantastic for observational astronomy, uh, and it's made possible by just incredible people, some of whom you'll meet tonight, uh, and making absolutely astounding discoveries about astronomy. So. Uh, so the first person we're going to be hearing from uh, is Luis Chavarria, who is the Director of Astronomy for, uh, for Chile's National Agency for Research, Research and Development. He's going to give us a little bit of the background on astronomy in Chile. Um, as always, tonight's program is live, so please say hi, let us know where you're watching from, and share any comments or questions in the chat. We'll have a Q&A with each guest, so make sure to get your questions in. Um, here's Luis. Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon, good night from my side. I hope you're doing very well. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the California Academy of Science to, for inviting me uh, to talk to you a little bit and tell you about uh, why astronomy is so big and important for us in Chile. So I'm going to just go right to the point here. Um, just uh, if you don't know anything about Chile, um, here you have a small comparison. This is the length of Chile. Chile is a super, super long country. Uh, it's kind of going from coast to coast in the US. That's real Chile. And it's a place with different environments, uh, different uh, weather, you know, climates, all over from north to south. Uh, you can have desert, uh, you have green areas, and very close to Antarctica, it's very cold. Um, of course, I'm cheating a little bit because the top photo, it was not uh, the desert, it was Mars, okay? This is the real desert in Atacama Desert where the telescopes are located. Just to show you how similar it could be to the Atacama Desert to, to landscapes like, uh, like Mars. So as you can see, the, there are different uh, things and geographical um, special locations in our country that we can make use of, uh, something that we call the natural labs. This is very important for us because as we are a small country, um, sometimes we don't have, or most of the time, we're not going to have all the resources that involve to finance this big uh, infrastructure for big science. So what are we doing is we're trying to use these geographical advantages that we have in order to bring bring the, the infrastructure to our country. And this is what has been happening in the north of Chile with astronomy. This is another photo taken from outer space. Uh, this is the north of Chile. And you can see in the lower right side, the Pacific Ocean. And you can see that the clouds coming from below there are going you know, through the ocean, but they just arrive at the coastline and they don't move further in, inland. And the same happens when the clouds coming from the other side, uh, and this photo will be Argentina and Bolivia. They don't cross to Chile. And that happened because of uh, a couple of reasons. From on one side, we have a cold current of ocean, it's called the Humboldt Current, coming from the Antarctica, going all the way from south to north. And what happens is that cold water uh, lower the altitude of the clouds. So the clouds just arrive to the coast and they stay there. On the other side, we have a chain of mountains, the Andes, it's a tall chain of mountains that uh, is like a wall between Chile, and um, natural wall between Chile, Argentina and Bolivia. And it doesn't allow the clouds coming from that side of the continent coming to Chile. So that 
creates a very specific and, and important geographical uh, climate, which is very dry. And that gives us uh, pretty much more than 80% of the clear nights uh, during the year, which is special, really good for everything that has to do with astronomy. And that's the reason why many of the big observatories in the world have been uh, constructed in our country since more or less like 60 years from now. This is just to show you the location uh, of the biggest uh, of the big observatories right now. They are usually located in, in three or four areas. On the north, you can see Alma, Apex, uh, the astronomical park, then closer to Antofagasta to the coast, Paraná telescopes, and then you go a little south, GMT, Las Campanas, La Silla, all these observatories, and then La Serena, Coquimbo, close to Gemini, uh, LSST. All the telescopes are located in that area, kind of in the north of Chile. Now, what happened with all these uh, geographical advantages that are bringing infrastructure for the big science in Chile? What happened is that that created a boom in the human resources that are doing astronomy. 60 years ago, there were a handful of astronomers working in Chile, but right now there are approximately 200 uh, faculty or professional astronomers working in almost 17 uh, different universities around the country. This is what you can see in this image. But if we add up, the the critical mass uh, including students and postdocs is around a thousand uh, people working in astronomy in our country which is pretty small we are 18 million people and this is this is very spectacular because uh, in different places in, in in our country there are astronomers and there are students and this is becoming something that people is more aware of uh, day by day now astronomy did not begin with the arrival of the big observatories in our country. It began hundreds of years ago um, with the cosmology of the native people that lived in, in, in this area in the world. This is just to show you an example of the Mapuche culture, which is uh, usually located in the south of Chile. But even though we're, they were not in the best places to do astronomy, this, the skies in the south of our Chile are super, super clear when it's not raining. And they were able to look at the stars and they were able also to identify seasons, which allows them to know the best moment to, uh, to grow vegetables. You know, um, um, and also that created a big and rich uh, cosmological culture. And this is just to show you an example. What, uh, what you can see there is two, two images um, showing something that we call the Southern Cross is the formation of stars that it is like a, a cross and then on the left side you can see other two bright stars which are alpha and beta centauri as you know alpha centauri is the place where proxima centauri is the closest star to the sun now for the mapuches that was a constellation um, where the cross was representing one animal and Alpha and Beta Centauri were representing a tool that was used for them to hunt this animal. The animal is called avestruz, oñandú, and this instrument is called boleadora. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's a ñandú and that's a boleadora. So what happened here is that this represents the hunting of this big bird. But in this case, the hunting was not successful because the boleadora didn't catch the bird. So that is written in the sky so the Mapuche can understand that we don't success all the time. Sometimes we fail. As you can see, well, th there are many other stories uh, about the cosmology of uh, all the native uh, population in Chile. Um, you can ask me later about that. So they were using the first telescopes that we were given with our, our eyes. But now we are using these other telescopes that are a little bit bigger using technology. And what I'm showing you here are the main telescopes or observatories that are being built right now in Chile, uh, going from the Giant Magellan Telescope, the LSST, the SICAT Prime, um, the ELT, uh, TAO. TAO is a telescope, you can see it in red in the middle, in the, in the lower part, which is going to be the highest telescope in the world. And also, you can see that it's a variety of different kinds of telescopes. Ones, uh, ones that uses uh, mirrors and all that are like antennas, uh, which are designed to observe different things in the sky. 
So now, what are we going to do uh, from, from now on with astronomy in Chile? We have all this infrastructure here that we are using as a scientist, but that infrastructure needs also very good advances in technology. This is just to show you an example. This is one of the instruments that is installed in ALMA. And you can see ALMA is 66 antennas, 66 telescopes. And if you're going to put an instrument there, you have to build 66 of those instruments. So we require some technological advances or technological infrastructure that can be, could be located also in Chile. And that is going to give us some external uh, advantage, external uh, disciplines that can be also part of the astronomical boom in our country. And also we could be able to extend the benefits that we gather from having infrastructure and technology in astronomy and move it to other disciplines. For example, in mining, smart cities, uh, uh, intelligent agriculture, satellites, communications, etc. So this is a way that we are trying to use our natural labs to have some benefits for the society in our country. One of the most important things that we have to do when we have a natural lab also is to take care of it. In this case, this is to show you that light pollution is a problem. It's a problem in the whole world, but it's also a problem for astronomy in Chile. And right now there are big efforts and big political efforts to change and to have regulations that are more modern and that will protect not only uh, the country, and people and animals, but specifically the places where the observatories are located. So this is work in process and this is the way that we are trying to protect our natural lab because we like it so much. Now, if we want to protect our natural lab, if we want to uh, have some social benefit from our natural lab, we have to create the, the idea in people of the importance of this natural lab. And the only way that we can do that is through education or through outreach activities. I mean, if we as astronomers, we stay uh, on the top of the mountain, if we don't tell the world what are we doing, it's going to be very hard then to convince people that for example, we, they will have to change the light bulbs because they are creating light pollution. So one of the big things that we are doing in the last years in Chile is uh, doing outreach activities and educating people about astronomy. So, one of the most important things about educating about astronomy is try to teach astronomy. And in that sense, I'm going to let the presentation uh, like that so we can go back to uh, put me in the big screen. So for that, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of uh, two experiments. One of them, you can do it at home. But the cool thing is that uh, I'm going to try to explain things that I believe that are fascinating about astronomy. One of the uh, most striking questions that I had when I was a student or when I was a beginner in astronomy was how are we able to identify molecules, for example, out of space? Because we cannot get there and take a little piece and then bring it here and then study it. So somehow we need to use uh, science to be able to identify different things that are super, super, super far away. So one of the things I work with, I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how we do that. And for that, I'm going to use a lamp. This is, this is my lamp. This is a lamp with a gas inside. And the gas that we have here is neon. And I have another one here that has hydrogen. And I'm going to turn on my lamp and I'm going to show you something. So when you have um, when you have a gas or when you have any material, uh, any atom of that material is composed by electrons that are going around the nucleus of the atom, which has protons and neutrons. So let's say that you are an electron and you are like electrons are cool. So you're an electron, you're just walking. I'm an electron, I'm cool. And then there is a photon and a photon hits you and it puts you a little. So what happens when you're, you know, walking in the street, cool, well, I'm an astronomer, I'm not cool, but I'm pretending to be cool. And then you get hit or pushed by someone. When you trip, you know, you accelerate a little bit, you get mad, but then you go back to your regular velocity or to your regular state. But that is 
Exactly, exactly, exactly like that. What happens with electrons that are in atoms in molecules? If you have a photon that hits that electron, the electron is going to be accelerated, but at some point it's going to go back to its normal state. And in this case, what we are doing in this experiment, we are taking a gas, in this case hydrogen, and we are we are passing a beam of uh, electricity. We are giving it power. We are pushing those electrons in that gas, and those electrons at the same time then are going back to their normal state. I'm going to move my camera to show you, and I'm going to use this tool, which is going to divide the light. And let's see what happens with this. So you can see there is the there is the lamp there. And with this device, which is like a prisma, we can see that there are different lines that are formed somewhere over there. So going from violet to blue and then some red lights. So what happens is that when you push the electron and the electron goes back to its normal state, it will emit a photon. The same way that when somebody pushed you and then you have to slow down, you know, to go to your normal uh, walking speed, you are using some energy there, energy to slow you down. In this case, these electrons, in order to go back to their normal state, they have to emit energy in the form of a photon. But that photon has a very specific energy. And what happens when you have a photon with a very specific energy? Well, for a photon, energy is a color. Our eyes interpret that energy as color. So in this case, hydrogen has a very specific pattern of colors in, in blue and red and violet. And now we are going to do something else. I'm going to turn off this lamp to take it out. And I'm going to change it with this lamp that contains another gas, neon. Let's do the same experiment. Show you like look, and you can see now there you go, that there is a bunch of lines. It's not just two or three. Then I'm going to go back here. Let me indicate with my finger. Okay, there. Well, that is a little bit saturated over there, but here you can see clearly there are many, many, many lines in other colors like yellow, orange, and red. But it's many, many, many more, more things going on there which uh, means kind of the hydrogen is, is kind of boring. Ooh, hydrogen, hydrogen boring. So what I'm trying to explain here is that different elements, different atoms in this case, and you can extrapolate that to different molecules because molecules are made by atoms, have different patterns of light. And those patterns, we can study them and learn them here in Earth with experiments like this. And then when we go to the telescopes and we observe the stars super far away, what we do is we use something like this, a prisma, and we look for those patterns. And that's the way that we can discover what are the elements that are composing those stars or what are the elements that are composing, for example, the atmosphere or of planets. And that's how you may remember a few weeks ago, there was an, an announcement that discovered a very, uh, a specific element in the atmosphere of Venus, which may indicate the presence of life. We don't know that it happened or not, but some of those telescopes that I was showing you are going to have the task of uh, look into the atmospheres of planets, exoplanets that are located and going around stars that are not the sun and try to identify molecules uh, that could tell us that is probably some life there. Um, so that's very interesting. Now, I'm going to do the second experiment, and when this I'm going to uh, finish, I like to do experiments. Um, I think that you have to, whenever we talk about astronomy, um, we need to teach something. If not, it's, it's not worth it. One of the biggest problems in astronomy, uh, when we talk about astronomy, is distances. Distances and size of things, because everything is super huge. So it's very difficult to imagine. What is going on? And when you say this is located one astronomical unit from here, from there, or 10,000 astronomical units, it's very hard to get an idea about how far, how close is that, how it's compared one thing to another. So what we try to do is that 
Uh, every time that we talk about the distance or something, we try to give an example with something that we can, I don't know, use at home or something that is more familiar to us. And in this case, I'm going to show you a system that is composed by the Earth and the Moon, but up to scale, okay? And the cool thing about this is that you don't need to know much math to do this. You can do it at home with your kids. Maybe tomorrow you can do it and you can share your photos. But also, uh, this could be an experiment that you can do uh, for people that uh, have some uh, visual uh, disability, okay? Let me show you the ingredients that we are going to use uh, in this case. Whoop, let me see. There you go. I have pepper, just one grain of pepper right there. And I also have one grain of quinoa, which is a smaller. So the only thing that we need to uh, take into account here is that one thing has to be one quarter, approximately, one quarter the size of the other thing, okay? So we are going to use these two ingredients. I'm going to put them in my hand so I can touch them and I can feel them. Even I can close my eyes and I can touch them and feel them. So what, I have, what I'm having here is that the pepper represents the earth and the quinoa represents the moon. And they are kind of at the same scale. So the, the size of the moon is approximately one quarter of the size of the earth. But now, about, what about the distance? Well, at this scale, these two objects will be separated approximately, let's say, it's like 20 centimeters. It's like the size of my hand. So you can extend your hand, kind of measure like that. So with this experiment, you can kind of feel what is the distance and the size of the Earth and the Moon. And it's pretty striking when you close your eyes and, and do it, because then you think that so many years ago, they sent uh, three lonely guys <laughs> from planet Earth to the Moon, and they are right there. For me, that is still amazing that, that they made it. And now, since I'm running a little bit out of time and you may need some time for questions, we're well, going to do the graph now. So if this is the size of the Earth, what do you think is the size of the Sun? Could be like this, could be like that, could be like this. Well, let me show you the size of the Sun at the same scale. This will be the size of the sun if the air were the size of one little, one little pepper, which is here. We can barely see it over there. <laughs> okay, so it's very impressive if you, for example, do this uh, with your kids and you tell them that this is the size of uh, the earth and then you have them close their eyes and then you give them something like this and they can hug the sun. See, a storm is fun. Okay. I'm going to leave it like that. And I think that we have a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you. Hi, Louise. Um, that was cool. I really like the experiments. We're getting a bunch of compliments on your shirt. So I wanted to mention that first. Uh, but the first question is, how did you first get into astronomy? Um, that was uh, because I watched too much TV when I was a kid. I really liked the science uh, TV shows. Um, you know, in Chile, we received those uh, TV shows that are made mostly in the US uh, with several years. <laughs> and, and those years, several <laughs> years later. So when I was a kid, I was watching Cosmos and, and things like that. And mm -hmm. that was very interesting to me. And I think that that was the first uh, triggering uh, of astronomy. Um, and then when I was in high school, I discovered that I was good in math and physics, and I liked it also. So little by little, I was trying to figure it out if I want to study engineering or you know, architecture. But then I decided that astronomy is more uh, free. <laughs> and I like freedom. <laughs> freedom is good. Um, along the same lines, what subjects would you recommend students study in order to work in the astronomy industry in Chile? Ah, that's a great question, because um, right now, if you take into account that we have uh, the observatories here, and, and the observatories, for example, like the LSST, which is called Vera Rubin right now, I don't remember the name. <laughs> um, those uh, big observatories are going to analyze, analyze a huge amount of data, like 
30 terabytes uh, per night. Uh, so that will require super cool programmers uh, because right now we don't know how to analyze that amount of data. Okay, so you can study, if you like computing, you like programming, you can work in astronomy. If, if you like, uh, you know, uh, uh, dissemble things at the home and you, you want to be an engineer, any kind of engineer that works with optics, uh, an electrical engineer, mechanical engineer. I mean, the ELT is, is a telescope that that is is 36 meters uh, in diameter. I don't know how, how much is that in, in feet, but it's, it's huge. It's like the size of a football field. And that thing weighs, you know, a hundred tons and you have to move it and you have to move it fast, you know, to point from one place to the sky. So you need a lot of different engineers, uh, discipline in engineering to, to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then our last question, um, given the COVID-19 situation, it seems very unlikely that foreign visitors can come to Chile for the December solar eclipse, like in 2019. Um, how are domestic preparations progressing? Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, right now, um, you cannot enter Chile, and that, that, that's sad. However, um, as far as I know, there, there are special permission for groups that want to do some kind of experiment or science involving the eclipse uh, now in December. So if any of you is involved in a group in a university that is planning on doing science or some kind of experiment, uh, you may get the permission to come to Chile. So I think that you should uh, prepare things right now. But the only way, uh, so far, the only way to enter Chile uh, right now is through that permission, because we don't know that, uh, if, we don't know if, if, the, if the country is going to be open by that time. Great. Um, I think that's all the time we have for Q and A. Thanks, Louise, for joining us tonight. Uh, next up, we have members of our planetarium team. We're going to bring back Ryan, and we'll also have Molly and Matt join to talk more about big astronomy. Wow. Well, thanks again, Louise. I uh, I admire the courage of anyone who will do a live experiment. <laughs> Uh, on streaming video. So thank you for that. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back and with two uh, remarkable members of our production team at the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, next to me here on the top is uh, Matt Blackwell, uh, who's a technical director in the Viz Studio, uh, as we call it affectionately, uh, and Molly Michelson down below, who's the senior producer uh, at the Academy. And they're part of a larger team who put a lot of effort into bringing the story of astronomy in Chile to life. And in fact, uh, we're gonna kind of expand on that answer that Luis gave to uh, what you need to study and what the career opportunities are uh, for astronomy in Chile, because uh, Molly is gonna kick off our description of how we produced the Big Astronomy Show uh, with a little bit of a backstory on some of the people who are featured in the show. So I'll turn things over to Molly. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so uh, this production included interviews of people who worked at each observatory that we feature. And not just astronomers. We included telescope operators, engineers, as Luis mentioned, data analysts, and much, much more. And it was my job to produce these interviews, which is the people part of big astronomy, people, places, and discovery. And if we could cue the first video, um, the process the, the process started about two and a half years ago when I reached out to folks in Chile via a relatively unknown technology, at the time anyway, Zoom. So see, these are some of the Zoom calls. And through each observatory's EPO, or Education and Public Outreach Officer, like Valeria Fonseca here on the left, we received names of various people who worked at each location with really an eye to diversity of jobs. Um, Alex on the right is from the south of Chile. He's not in the show, but he's a medic who makes sure that people making the 16,000 foot trek up to the Alma high site are healthy before they leave and when they get there. And we also got, I also got sneak peeks of different locations we were gonna visit, like this one here. Uh that one is the LS, LSST, Gemini, and SOAR. 
And so if you could cue the next video for me, um, I wanted to share- School? Um, Not like school at all. <laughs> actually, sorry about that. Um, the larger big astronomy team, we knew we wanted to look for people who were different. And these are the things we wanted to know. Um, how did their work support the science, the astronomy that was done at each telescope? Did people have science backgrounds? Did they even like science? In some cases, we were more interested in those who struggled with the subject with school because there are so many different careers at these telescopes. Uh, what kind of things did they like to do for fun? And then finally, and I think the most interesting thing, what were their lives like working at these telescopes? Often their schedules are eight days on and six days off. So that means they live at these telescopes, sleeping and eating on site. It also means that their colleagues are their friends and I mean their families, which can be the best and worst. <laughs> so I wanted to share a few of my favorite examples. And the first one who we saw a sneak peek of previously is Alfredo. And he's featured in the show and he runs these big transporters at Alma, which move the radio telescopes from one place to another. So now if we could cue that video, thanks. School? Not like school at all. <laughs> Very boring. Uh, I have passed like through seven schools because it was like, uh, it wasn't my thing. I didn't like to study too much. So I, I just like uh, think about working. I think you always like had this fantasy about like the big machines uh, making money and to be able to be free and travel around the world maybe. So his dreams came true. And then we have Daniela, and she is a telescope operator um, who misses her little girl when she's working the eight days, but loves to play soccer with her colleagues during downtime. And Eduardo, he is the construction manager here at the Vera Rubin telescope. And he says that safety comes first on the job, but when the project is I over- I think that I will have more time to pick up my motorcycle and ride to Viña del Mar. Very fast. <laughs> and then we have uh, Fabiola. She's a, she manages a team of engineers at Alma, and they like to call her mom. And in the, if you could cue the next video. We live here. So it's not, a, okay, I have a discussion with you. I'm not happy. I'm going home. I see you next morning. No, here we keep. I will see your face. Dinner time, breakfast time. And we have to know and have good relations. So I think that is part of the most challenging to keep everybody comfortable and happy. <laughs> yeah. And finally, we have Alex. He oversees the residential and dining facilities at Cerro Tololo, and he connects with his staff over meals. Es un momento entre comillas de relajo y y de degustar. Eh, eh, los platos que prepara nuestro chef acá en el cerro para que la lejanía de nuestra familia no, no se sienta tanto eh, así poder conversar y, y disfrutar de, de una buena comida y no echar de menos la casa tampoco que, que eso es bien, es bien importante um, and if you could cue the very last video um, in the end we in the end we interviewed 29 people uh, most of them in both Spanish and English, and it was a great experience, one of the highlights of my career. And this is from the show, and it's my most favorite part, because um, each circle is the are the people we interviewed, and they, I consider them all friends of mine. Um, and I encourage you to get to know them more. Eight, we feature eight of them in the show, and you can get to know the rest of them um, very soon at bigastronomy.org. And that's it for me, thanks. Well, thank you, Molly. And uh, what Molly didn't say is that she also really helped shape those interviews into a really compelling story, which is an important part of what we tried to do with Big Astronomy is to tell the story of uh, the people, places, and again, discoveries, and to share a little bit about how we captured some of these remarkable places, these incredible observatories. I wanted to turn things over to Matt Blackwell uh, to talk about some of the camera techniques and some of the technology that we deployed uh, to, uh, to take uh, viewers of Big Astronomy down to Chile. 
Hello, everybody. I'm Matt. Um, and as Ryan said, I'm going to show you a bit about how we shot the footage uh, for Big Astronomy. Um, our whole production was shot on two cameras. Uh, if you could show my slides, please. Um, so on the left here, you see a Sony Venice, which is a cinema quality uh, video camera that we use for most of our footage. But when we wanted a low light shot, like of the night sky, and we wanted to show the passage of large amounts of time, um, then we had to go with time-lapse photography. And for that, we used uh, the camera on the right, which is a Sony uh, mirrorless A7R III camera. In both cases, we used a fisheye lens. You can see the same lens on both of these cameras. Um, and fisheye lens has a 180 degree uh, hemispherical f uh, field of view, and that matches the hemisphere of our dome. So the image covers the whole dome. You'll also note whenever I show pictures of our cameras, that they're pointed up. And the reason for that is that our dome is tilted at 30 degrees from the horizontal. And so the tilt of the camera matches the orientation of our dome. Uh, my main focus in this, uh, in, the, in the production was doing time-lapse photography, but I do want to give you a quick uh, overview of how we shot footage with the Sony Venice. Um, one thing you have to know is that moving a camera makes a scene more interesting, but because the planetarium dome is a large immersive environment, we have to be really careful with our camera motions because movement can make the audience motion sick. So we've got to be slow and really, really steady, which means you can never really hold a camera like this by hand when you're shooting for the dome. And we had to use devices that would give us smooth motions, but also interesting motions. Um, so if you could show the first movie, please. Uh, so one way of doing that is to put the camera on a set of rails. And inside you see Ken Ackerman operating the camera. Um, and basically you've got these parallel rails, so you put the camera on a wheeled platform and then you just slide it carefully from one side to the other, uh, which gives you a motion like you see here in this clean room shot. Um, if you could show the next movie, please. Uh, the second way to do this is with a jib, which is basically like a balanced teeter-totter where the camera goes on one side of it and you kind of operate the camera by moving the other side gently around. And that we found is best for these kind of vertical shots where the camera just rises up gradually and gives you a, a good sense of perspective and distance. And then the third motion, if you could cue the next movie, please. Um, on our second trip to collect footage, we had a new piece of equipment that allowed us to detach the camera lens and sensor from the body of the camera. In the inset, you can see Mike Schmidt on the left holding the body of the camera, and Lucas Garcia is one of the Chileans we worked with on our trip, um, holding a gimbal stabilizer, where you basically put the sensor in the stabilizer, and the, set, the gimbal will compensate for a lot of the walking motion. So then you can, in fact, do a walking motion with the camera, and most of the walking movement is removed from the footage. And we use this to shoot David Barrera walking in the Atacama Desert. So now on to time-lapse uh, footage, which is my main responsibility. Um, and I'd like to show you three time-lapse shots that didn't make it into the show, but are actually really interesting nonetheless. Uh, most of you have probably seen time-lapse. Um, it involves basically taking regularly spaced photos over a, large, over a period of time, and then you play it back quicker and you can see things happening at an accelerated pace. We used a digital camera controlled by a timer. So here's that same camera again on a tripod. Sometimes we just had it static. Um, even though I said a moving shot is a more interesting shot, when you're looking at the night sky, the stars moving, the stars can provide the motion. So that's what we did some of the time. Um, and we generally had a timer hooked up to it so they'd take an exposure every five or 15 seconds, something like that. Um, sometimes we put it on a set of rails. So this is kind of the computerized version of the thing I was showing you earlier where you pre-program a motion to be executed over a period of hours when no one is present, um, and the camera executes that motion over the, over the course of the time-lapse. Um, and because time-lapse takes hours to capture and usually nobody's there while the camera is doing its thing, the results can be pretty surprising. It's kind of like developing the contents of a film camera. You don't always know what you're gonna get until you take a look at it afterwards. Um, and today I'm gonna show you some of our surprises. So one day, um, or I, we've already introduced you briefly to Cerro Tololo and Cerro Pachon, um, two mountains that are separated, both of the observatories on, they're separated by an hour long twisty dirt road. So this is the view from the Blanco telescope at Cerro Tololo over to Cerro Pachon, where you see on the left, the Gemini telescope, and on the right, the under construction Vera Rubin telescope, formerly called LSST. Uh, one day, um, I set up a time lapse at Cerro Tololo, looking down over the sur surrounding countryside. And then we took a trip over to see the Gemini Observatory at Cerro Pachon. And when we were done there, I set up another time lapse looking at the Gemini Observatory. 
uh, as it got dark, and then we left. And as we left to return to Saratololo, there was an earthquake. It was a 6.7 earthquake, so a pretty good size, about 50 miles away. Happily, neither us nor our equipment was damaged. And as it turned out, both of my time lapses captured what happened. So if you could uh, cue the next movie, please. This is the Gemini Observatory operating normally initially. That laser is an instrument that's used to compensate for atmospheric distortion. Um, and I'll sh this movie will loop. I'll point out the earthquake next time it happens. But the earthquake is very quick because the camera is only taking a frame every 10 seconds or so. Um, and so if you watch for it now, look at the observatory. And right there is the earthquake. That's it. Um, and if you look over to the right, you'll see some lights zigzagging down the road. That's our cars leaving. Um, and you also, if you watch the horizon, you'll see some city lights that go out when the earthquake happens. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting record of that event at the Gemini Observatory. Meanwhile, over at Saratololo, my other camera is operating. So if you go to the next movie, please. And if you watch this rock in the front, and there's the earthquake, the rock appears to jerk to one side. And what's actually happening is the camera was on that rail contraption and the camera got shoved hard to one side by the earthquake. And then if you look down in the scenery beyond, you'll notice this huge cloud of dust gets, gets kicked up. That's the dirt road that we were driving on. And that dust is being kicked up off the dirt road by the earthquake. And then in distance, again, you'll see city lights that go out when the earthquake happens. So as you can see, none of these, neither of these two shots was really going to be any use for telling the story of big astronomy, but they're really interesting. And so I'm really happy to have, uh, had a chance to show them to you, their record of an event that we couldn't possibly have planned. So a couple months later, if you go back to my slides, please, um, we took another trip uh, up to the Atacama Desert to visit the Alma Observatory. And um, this is a site that's really hard to visit. It's over 16,000 feet, access is tightly controlled, and if the weather turns bad, the visit is off. And though the Atacama Desert is famously dry, it's not entirely dry. And in fact, it rained the first day we were gonna visit, the Alma site, and here we are at a lower site, trying at a maintenance facility, trying to film in the rain in one of the driest places on the earth. Um, so we couldn't go up and visit the actual Alma telescope site that day. Um, things worked out a bit better the second time around and we got up there and I was able to place the camera and here's what that camera looked like as we drove away and left it overnight by itself. Um, but as it turned out, we were not done with the bad weather. If you could show the next movie, please. Uh, and instead of a time lapse of the night sky over Alma, we got a time lapse of a snowstorm over Alma, um, which again is not something we could have used in big astronomy, but it's a fascinating record of something that basically nobody will ever see in person. Um, and fortunately, we had another visit uh, uh, scheduled, and on that third trip, everything went fine. I set up three time lapse cameras and uh, got all the night sky Alma time-lapse footage that you see in big astronomy. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for watching. Yeah, thank you, Matt. It's, uh, it was uh, challenging enough to be at 16,000 feet um, without a snowstorm. I think surviving a snowstorm up there would be even, uh, even uh, more unpleasant. Uh, well, Molly had a chance to tell you about the people, Matt, a little bit about the places. And so I just wanted to wrap up our description of uh, making a big astronomy with a little bit about the discoveries. I think one of the things that's really incredible is that these phenomenal observatories in uh, in Chile, which I, I began to think of as like industrial astronomy. You know, we think of, I think a lot of people think of astronomers as going up to the top of a mountain and like peering through an eyepiece uh, through a telescope. That's just not what happens at all. These instruments are phenomenally complex and they're designed often for kind of one purpose but they can actually do a lot of different work. In the show, we focus on the story of how planets form. It's a compelling question in astronomy and amazing discoveries are being made in Chile on that topic. So we weave a story of uh, a planetary formation uh, through the story of the people and the places. Uh, and if we can play the video, I just wanna start at the location of uh, the dark energy camera in uh, Saratololo. Uh, we're departing from the Victor and Blanco telescope, and this is how we integrate the, the place with the discovery. So leaving the dark energy camera behind, what we're actually doing is we're going to show you some of the data that's been collected by the dark energy camera. And although it was designed, as its name suggests, to study a cosmological phenomenon at great, great distances, 
we've now left Earth behind. We're seeing the orbits of our planets around the sun. We're highlighting those uh, just as a reminder for everyone who's maybe a few years out of elementary school uh, to, uh, to get up to speed on where we are in the solar system. This is actually an interesting illustration of Louise's sort of sense of scale as well. Uh, but in addition to the planets, there are all of these minor objects, these kind of icy bodies out of the edge of the solar system. And we're gonna highlight the locations of those. And I think what's interesting is uh, the dark energy camera has discovered many of these. And while it was designed to look for things at incredibly great distances, it's finding things that are relatively close to home. These are still hundreds of millions of miles away. However, they are pretty close to Earth in the grand scheme of things, astronomically speaking. And so one of the ideas that we wanna communicate is we present uh, Big Astronomy Live, which we're doing every Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. Pacific on the Academy's YouTube channel, as well as the Big Astronomy YouTube channel, is we want to highlight some of the other discoveries being made uh, by these remarkable telescopes. And so although the story that we tell you uh, in Big Astronomy is about planetary formation, and in this case, for example, we visit uh, uh, kind of the artist's conception of one of these objects in orbit around the sun, while we tell that one story uh, in the pre-recorded part of Big Astronomy, for the live section, we're going to tell you a lot more about other observations and other discoveries being made at Chile's amazing observatories. So again, 1130 in the morning Pacific uh, on the Academy's YouTube channel and on the Big Astronomy YouTube channel, you can tune in and learn more about other astronomical discoveries happening uh, in Chile. So we'll take you back home. We're actually taking you back to Chile here in this uh, video. And uh, that kind of concludes our production part of this evening's uh, presentation about Chile. So I think we'll bring back Bali and Matt and uh, think, see if we have any questions. Yeah, that was, that was so interesting. And I love just hearing about your different roles. And um, it seems like there's so much uh, like just so much work went into this and like how long did it take you to produce this show and like before going to Chile to film and during? The, the show was actually funded by the National Science Foundation here in the US. So the ideation process started about three years ago uh, and we put all of that proposal into a, into a grant uh, and described to the National Science Foundation the kind of show that we wanna make. We then waited six months as the clock was ticking uh, to produce the show. And uh, Molly did a tremendous, all those uh, Zoom interviews that you saw, those were happening behind the scenes as we're still waiting to find out if we had money to make the show. And so about two and a half years ago is when we really started to ramp up. And about, in fact, just two years ago, uh, Molly and I were down in Chile uh, capturing those, those interviews. Uh, and then we went back over a period of several more months. And so the whole production process uh, from the ideation phase to completion uh, was a little little over two years, um, but uh, there was a very um, kind of frenzied period of activity when we were actually traveling down to Chile uh, to, to capture the footage and then weaving that into a story, which I think is uh, a really important part as well. Yeah, I mean, that's another big question for um, for Molly. I mean, one, will, will there be, you know, footage, unreleased footage put somewhere online in the future? Because there seems like you really interviewed a lot of interesting people. So how did you kind of choose who to interview and how to put them in the story? Yeah, it was really tough. I I think everyone I spoke to was so interesting in their own way. You know, some people were, we. there's a, a couple of Americans we interviewed who are working in Chile and one of the women featured in the show is Venezuelan. So there are people from all over the place who work there and then their jobs are so interesting. And then on top of that, their lives are so interesting because their jobs are so much part of really hard to kind of narrow it down to who was in the show and then, um, and then the idea was all along that there would be this second component at bigastronomy.org where you could learn more about the jobs that are available at these telescopes and about the way Chileans think about astronomy. So there are even a couple of indigenous people that we interviewed who share kind of their beliefs um, and their people's beliefs in the in in the cosmos. So it was it was hard to narrow it down, but it was it was so great to get to know to everybody. Awesome. Yeah. 
Um, and then Matt, you, it was really, people are saying like how cool it was to see all the equipment that you used to film and all the different methods. So how did this um, differ from other planetarium shows you've worked on, the Morrison Planetarium? Well, most of our planetarium shows tend to be all completely or almost all computer graphics. And um, most of us in the video studio are computer graphics artists by trade of one flavor or another. Um, although computer graphics for this kind of production always uses the language of photography and the language of movie making. Very few of us have spent a lot of time behind an actual camera professionally. Um, mm. So we spent a lot of time figuring out what camera to use, what the right technology was, what the camera was that would allow us to get the shots, figuring out, you know, how we could get the motions, like what all those, you know, those different devices we use with the, with the Sony Venice for the video footage, we had to research all of those. And there were probably yeah. as many other devices that we kind of tested out and then said, no, that's not going to work. It's too complicated. It doesn't give us anything that the others get, don't give us and so on and so forth. And then as far as time-lapse photography goes, that was kind of my big project for this. Mm -hmm. I kind of knew more or less how it worked, but I had never done it. Um, and basically starting six months before my first trip to Chile, I dove in, learned how all the equipment worked, learned how to put it together, take it apart so well that I wouldn't have to think about it when I was on site, and just kind of drove out to places like Yosemite and just started <laughs> taking time lapses. And it was, it was quite a learning curve, but the really good thing about it is when I got to Chile, I didn't have to think about how to do it right. I could just do it without thinking too much, which as it turns out when you're at 16,000 feet especially, is really the way it needs to be because your brain doesn't work so well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I bet you have a lot of really great Yosemite time lapses that you Yeah, I, I've got a couple that turned out, really, I, turned out really well, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, the, the three of you, for being a part of this and doing so much. You're doing so much work around big astronomy, like now that it's also released. So, um, yeah, I really encourage everyone watching to come back to our YouTube channel and um, catch a screening of it. So thanks so much. And um, next we have um, Javier Ray. She's an astronomer and also the co-founder of the blog and YouTube channel Star Trace. And, um, and uh, take it away. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks, Christina, for that introduction. <laughs> hello everyone in the chat. Thank you for having me today. Um, so today I want to talk to you about some very cool astronomical discoveries made from Chile. Now that you've seen all the, the telescopes that we have in this beautiful country. <laughs> and also I'm going to mention a few outreach initiatives also uh, from Chile. So you can see who are the people sharing uh, all the astronomy and all these cool discoveries here in, in Chile. Okay, so, oops, sorry. <laughs> so there are a lot, a lot, a lot <laughs> of discoveries that are made each year with the telescopes that we have in Chile. So I wanted to talk to you about a few of them. It was pretty hard to choose. <laughs> so I have these six. So I'm going to briefly mention um, the accelerating expansion of the universe. Uh, also the neutron star collision, um, the black hole that we have in the center of our Milky Way. You might have heard of that one because there was an Nobel Prize this week that was related to that. Um, also, the detection of, of phosphine in Venus, in Venus atmosphere, uh, the first image of a black hole, that was pretty cool, um, and also exoplanets. So we're going to start with the first one, and it's the accelerating expansion of the universe. So this one was also a Nobel Prize in um, 2011. So it was Perlmutter, Schmidt, and Rice who won the Nobel Prize. And of course, as the name says, the discovery was that our universe was not only um, expanding, but it was expanding uh, with an acceleration. So it was even faster than uh, before. But uh, for this discovery, there was a very, very important survey 
that contributed, let's say, about half of the work. <laughs> so it was the Calanto Lolo survey. And it was carried out at Cerro Tololo. So we've heard of this observatory um, before. And you can see there are many telescopes here. So this project uh, was started almost almost in the 90s. It was in 1989. Um, the lead um, astronomers were Mario Amui and Jose Massa, which are from Chile, and also Mark Phillips and Nicolas Sansef. So what they were trying to do was to look for a, a very specific type of supernovae, which are called the supernovae type 1A, uh, to see if they could use those supernovae to uh, determine distances in our universe. So what they did is that they were observing um, with <laughs> very big um, photographic plates. So it was 25 uh, squares degrees uh, to uh, look for the supernovae. And when they found one, they used another telescope to observe it. They took what it's called a light curve. And then they also used another two additional telescopes uh, to do a spectroscopy of this supernovae. So at the end, they found uh, 50. So it was a lot. And out of those 50, uh, 32 were the type that they were looking for, the type 1A. And these supernovae were super, super important. They um, concluded that they were useful to determine distances. And they are roughly half of the data that was used uh, to discover the accelerating expansion of the universe. So that was uh, super, super cool and very important. Now, the next one is the neutron star collision. So what is this, this thing? So maybe you have heard from the LIGO and Virgo observatories. So these are um, observatories that do not observe stars, but they observe uh, gravitational waves. So they have this very complicated configuration of lasers. <laughs> and uh, when the, um, the space time is um, expanded or contracted, these lasers, lasers are going to detect these changes. So what they did is that uh, when they detect um, a gravitational wave passing through Earth, they have an alert. So in this case, there was an alert of objects that were colliding, that were smaller, uh, less massive than a black hole. So they thought at first that the masses correspond to a neutron star colliding with another neutron star. And uh, what the alert does is that it's going to uh, let astronomers look for the object. So people started looking for this uh, source of gravitational waves. And it was a Chilean student. She was uh, doing her master's in uh, a city called La Serena. Um, and she was observing at Las Campanas Observatory in a very small telescope. Actually, it's just a one meter telescope. It's called the Henrietta Swap Telescope. It was built in 71. So it's actually the oldest telescope of that observatory. And so she was observing, she received the alert and she started to look for this source and she found it. And she became the first human being to observe a neutron star collision. So that uh, source is what is called the um, optical counterpart of a gravitational wave source. So yeah, she was everywhere in the news. <laughs> She's now like super famous here in Chile. So that was a super cool discovery. It was made by a girl, by a student. She was Chilean and with the smallest and oldest telescope of the Las Campanas Observatory. And also um, at the same observatory, there are some bigger and newer telescopes called the Magellans. And the Magellans also were the first ones to observe uh, the, the spectrum of this uh, neutron star collision. So that was super important too because they managed to see how the heavy elements were being formed when the collision was happening. Now, this one is, is not recent, but it was recently in the news because of the uh, new Nobel Prize in Physics. So uh, this year's uh, Nobel Prize was awarded to three people. So one of them was Roger, Roger Penrose, and it was because of the discovery of the black hole formation. Um, and he predicted this from the general theory of real relativity. And the other half of the prize uh, went for Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Guess for the discovery of a supermassive compact object in the center of our galaxy. So we didn't know at first that there was a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy, but they started to study 
this um, this region and the movement of the stars that we can find there. So it was they were uh, leading two different groups. So Andrea, I guess on one side was studying this um, this region with telescopes from the northern hemisphere. So she was using the Keck telescopes in Hawaii, while uh, Reinhard Gensel was using uh, telescopes from the south. He was ESO telescopes, so he started almost 30 years ago <laughs> in 1992 with the NTT telescope at La Silla Observatory, and then he moved uh, to the VLT. So yeah, each of the leaders uh, got um, one quarter of the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And what this is showing here actually is um, that even though you cannot see the, um, the supermassive black hole, you can see how the stars move around it and you can deduce the mass of the object that should be there to cause these movements. And it was a, it was very hard work to observe the center of the Milky Way and follow all these stars for a very long time so they can uh, determine the orbits that these objects have. And this is the first telescope that they use. So it's a four meter telescope. And as I said, it's located in La Silla. Um, so yeah, this is the, the entity. Then this one is also new. It was like, I think in September. Um, and it was announced that there was a detection of a molecule called phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. So this discovery, so the first detection was made uh, with a radio telescope called the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope. And it's located in the Northern Hemisphere. So it's also in, in Hawaii. And then uh, they needed a bigger and better telescope to confirm this detection. And that's why they used ALMA. So ALMA, we saw some very beautiful images before in videos. It's located in the north of Chile. And these antennas uh, were used to confirm this detection and uh, get more detail out of it as well. So phosphine is a molecule. And uh, we believe, uh, so there are two possible uh, sources for this molecule. So the first, first one is a non-biological one. So it could be like uh, from photochemistry or geochemistry. And then the other one is uh, a bi biological origin. So what the astronomers did is that they, they tried to see um, how much phosphine was in, in the atmosphere of Venus and how could we form that quantity, uh, like via which methods we could have uh, that amount of, of phosphine. Uh, and their conclusion was that actually with the methods that we know that are non-biological, we couldn't do it. It wasn't possible. So there are two possibilities now. One possibility is that there are unknown processes of photochemistry or geochemistry that are producing this phosphine. And that's super exci exciting because these are processes that we don't know yet. So it's new science to be discovered. And the other one that for some is even more exciting is that it is from biological origin. So there could be uh, life producing this phosphine in Venus. And as I said, this was observed uh, by ALMA. Then we also have the first image of a black hole. Mm -hmm. This was also like everywhere, everywhere <laughs> on the news. Uh, we, it was super cool because we, we knew that black holes were there. As I mentioned before, we could see the movement of the stars around a black hole. We could see sometimes the, um, the jets. These are emissions that come uh, from a black hole, but we've never seen a black hole. So this was the first time. Um, and how this image was taken was using a, a telescope it's actually a, a telescope, <laughs> which is called the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT. Um, and actually, it's not one telescope, but it's many telescopes. It's eight different observatories. Each of them might have one uh, antenna or more. And they are forming this global network of radio telescopes. And they need this many because they need a resolution that it's so good so you can have uh, this picture of this black hole. So it's not possible just to, to have, for example, ALMA 
and and try to take this picture with that you need something a lot a lot bigger so you need this uh, very big base light um, so among these eight telescopes that were part of the Event Horizon Telescope, there are two from Chile. So one is ALMA and the other one is uh, APEX. So that's uh, the Atacama uh, Pathfinder experiment. And this is another picture of uh, ALMA. So that's how they took this picture. It was a black hole that was 6.5 billion suns. That was the mass of the black hole. And it's in the center of a galaxy called Messier. 87 or M87. And that galaxy, it's located around 53 million light years from us. So it's it's pretty far, but not so far for an astronomical object. <laughs> and then we have exoplanets. So exoplanets are my favorite subject. <laughs> uh, there was also a Nobel Prize related to this. It was last year. Uh, so it was a it was yeah, it was a bit weird. So it was the for the contribution to our understanding of the evolution of the universe and something like um, to know the the place that our Earth has in the in the universe. So it was awarded to Jane Peebles, who was a is a cosmologist, and also Michel Mayor and Didier Kelos, who were the discoverers of the first extrasolar planet around the sun-like star. Um, so. This uh, first exoplanet around the sun-like star, it's called 51 Pegasi B, so 51 Peg B. It was discovered in 95. And from that moment, there was all this new like area of astronomy that was open, a new subject. And uh, right now, there are a lot of people working on this. There are people from Chile working on this as well. And we know more than 4,000 exoplanets. So that's a lot. We have a very wide variety of different planets, planets that we didn't know it existed, and uh, now we know. So these are the discoveries that I wanted to mention. So as you saw, some of them were made with telescopes installed in Chile. Some of them were made by Chilean astronomers. And I also wanted to mention that everyone involved in um, in an observatory's work is also part of the, these discoveries. So not only the scientists, but also the people that work at an observatory, for example, the chefs, the people that clean the rooms, the people that are in charge of the hotel, the drivers that take you up to the observatory. So they all feel part of these uh, very big discoveries because they are all helping um, to the observatory's work. And now, Oh, sorry. <laughs> that was one of the instruments that are used to discover exoplanets. Yeah, I forgot that part. So actually, yeah, the contribution from Chile is that we have all these uh, very precise instruments to discover exoplanets. So for example, this one is HARPS. Uh, it's in um, in the biggest telescope in La Silla. So it's a 3.6 telescope, uh, 3.6 meters. Uh, we also have the Planet Finder spectrograph in Las Campanas and a lot of instruments at the VLT telescope that not only uh, do spectroscopy, but they also take very cool images of exoplanets. And now for outreach. Uh, so we have several, several, several uh, institutions and projects and groups doing outreach in Chile. So I'm going to mention some of them. So of course, I'm going to start uh, with the one I'm part of. <laughs> And that's uh, Star Tres. Uh, so Star Tres is a group of three astronomers, all Chilean. So it's uh, me. I think you saw me. You saw me at the beginning. And Karina Rojas. This is her. And Carolina Agurto. Um, so that's like our personal signature. We're all women. We're all from Chile, and we're all astronomers. And uh, Star Tres started as a blog, and it evolved over time. And right now. Uh, we're focused on our YouTube channel. It's the place where we have uh, most of our followers. So we have around uh, 30,000 um, subscribers. So we do videos about astronomy in general, sometimes about uh, astronomy news. Sometimes um, we want to debunk something because there, are, there is something in the news that the, the journalists didn't get right. So. We do a bit of everything. These are very short videos, around five minutes, and they are very funny, very dynamic. So uh, if you want to check the channel, you can find us as Startres on YouTube. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter and our website, startres.net. I also wanted to mention uh, some other colleagues. 
uh, for example, Astroblog. So that's his uh, nickname. So his name is Ricardo Garcia. He's a science communicator. Uh, he shares astronomy, I would say, everywhere. <laughs> he has his um, social media content. He also has a very big YouTube channel. Um, and he was also the host of a TV show called Hijos de las Estrellas. It was the second season of the show. Um, and he also has a podcast, which is a uh, very... Uh, famous <laughs> among people who like astronomy in Spanish. And it's called Astronomía y Algo Más. So it's like astronomy and something more. Uh, so you can find them pretty much everywhere on social media as Astroblog. And you will find links to all the content that he's doing. Then we have Pequeñas Grandes Estrellas. So this is Little Big Stars. This is a project. It's very, very cool. And it's focused on preschool kids. They even have this, uh, this is a fox. Uh, her name is Nova. <laughs> so it's like the, the mascot of the, of the project. And so before uh, COVID, they were doing a lot of DIY activities and workshops um, for preschool kids. And right now they had to change their strategy a bit. So what they're doing now is a series of videos, which are called Astro Que. So this is like Astro What? <laughs> And so they have um, uh, these like uh, Google Forms where people can send their questions and kids can also can send their questions. And then they have a group of around 30 astronomers that are going to answer these questions on video. Um, so they have like an, a, gen uh, a general astro que for like general public and they also have an astro que for kids. So, of course, those are questions uh, from kids and they are explained in a different way so that all kids can understand. So you can find uh, Pequeñas Grandes Estrellas on Instagram uh, as Fundación PGE, PGE. Planeta Errante, so this is Wandering Planet. He's one of my favorite uh, <laughs> astronomy communicators in Chile. Because look at this, this is so cute. I mean, the colors, the faces, it's like, it's, it's too cute. Uh, so what he does is that he he's also an illustrator. So he's a doctor in astronomy and also an illustrator. And he shares astronomy through his uh, drawings. And a good thing is that he has uh, his content both in Spanish and English. So, if you want to read his content in English, you should go to Instagram and look for wandering.planet. Otherwise, you can find him as Planeta Errante if you want to check the content in Spanish. And he also hosts a podcast with another astronomer called Elise Cervajan, and it's called Jugo de Ciencia. So it's like science juice. So that's pretty cool too. And finally, I wanted to mention uh, Astronomía Inclusiva. So this is inclusive astronomy. So what they do is that they work to adapt the content, the astronomy content for people who are either visually impaired or blind or deaf people. And actually there were several groups in uh, different universities uh, and they got together. So this uh, inclusive astronomy is the group that has all these different um, institutions and people doing this um, inclusive work uh, for people with any disabilities. So it's a very, very beautiful work. And you can find them in also on Instagram as astro.inclusiva. And of course, there are many, many, many other people who are working in uh, outreach in Chile. So of course, I don't have the time to mention them all, but I wanted to leave you with <laughs> some pictures. So one thing that I wanted to mention is that a lot of them are very young. So this is the new generation of people doing outreach in Chile. And some of them are not so young, <laughs> but still their work is super important. And yeah, I really hope that this continues like this and more people uh, feel like um, engaged to this beautiful work that is astronomy outreach. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you.
Thanks, Javiera. I first want to say thanks for staying up so late to hang out with us. Oh, no. like past <laughs> midnight worry. over there. Uh, so our first question, you mentioned with Star Trek that you've had to film some videos on debunking some, some theories and some things. What's the wildest or craziest thing you've ever had to debunk about astronomy? Wow. So one of the first one was that Mars was going to be observed of the same size as the moon. That was very crazy. And lately we've done a lot of content on the colors on the moon because somehow you you, you know that the moon uh, sometimes in the States they use like um, like nicknames like the pink moon or the wolf moon. And I don't know why sometimes when people share the content, they put a picture of an actual pink moon. <laughs> so it's like, no, 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 guys, you're not going to see a pink moon. So sometimes people don't know that you're not able to see the moon in that color and they believe that they will be able to. So it is important to say that these are just names and yeah, you're not going to see it in a different color unless there is something in the atmosphere and things like that. Cool. Um, <laughs> this was a question earlier. So I. Well, this is not for me, but I was told that some of the native cultures of Chile told stories about the space between the stars and the sky, not just of the stars. Can you tell me where I can find more information about this? Oh, I'm not sure about that. I have heard, however, that they, um, it, like instead of having constellations like with the stars, mm -hmm. they saw figures in the, like the empty spaces of the sky. So for example, when you have like a, um, a cloud that it's blocking you the light of the stars that are behind, you would see something black and they saw like figures of, I don't know, llamas and things like that. But I don't know if they mean like the space between us and the stars because yeah, I haven't heard of that, but maybe there is some information somewhere, but I'm not sure. Um, and then one more question. Can you please share some of the current projects that are taking place in the observatories in Chile right now? Oh, so they are just coming back because they were closed during COVID. <laughs> so Makes this sense. week, yeah, this week they are starting to open again. So I saw one of the telescope operators in the chat, Alberto, he's uh, working in Las Campanas and they are opening this uh, week. Uh, I don't know about the specific uh, projects. I do know that, for example, the one that I mentioned for the, um, um, the, the first picture of a black hole, they're also using these same telescopes to observe the black hole of our Milky Way. So I don't know, maybe we will have a picture of uh, that black hole soon. <laughs> and also we have some like uh, projects that run all the time, for example, um, exoplanet detection and things like that. Those are like mm -hmm. every night almost. <laughs> cool. Um, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us, Javiera. Um, I'm going to bring Thank on you. Christina now. Hi. I'm back. <laughs> uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in. And a special thanks to Louise, Ryan, Molly, Matt, and Javiera for joining us tonight. Um, next week, we're talking wildlife in the city pigeons, frogs, coyotes, and raccoons, and how these species are evolving in response to living in some of the least natural environments on the planet. We'll also chat about how structural inequalities don't just affect humans and the cities they live in, but also shape the outcomes of the wildlife that live in them. And if you haven't heard already, uh, the Academy is reopening. Um, we'll be open to members starting October 13th and to everyone else on October 23rd. And Thanks again so much for your support during the seven months we've been closed. Um, we wouldn't be here without you. And nightlife isn't returning to the building just yet, but we will definitely let you know um, mm -hmm. as soon as we do. <laughs> and um, in the meantime, we're still here. We're still doing night school online uh, Thursday nights. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel um, to get notifications about all our live stream programs. Go check out Big Astronomy also, um, bigastronomy.org. You can find information about where to watch it. And thanks again so much for being here. Uh, you're the reason we do this. So good night, everyone. Night.